Friends, good morning and welcome to Crossroads United Methodist Church online. We are excited and glad that you've joined us here this morning. One quick announcement before we begin. Not to depress you, but Christmas is coming up and we are getting ready and ramping up for our Christmas giveaway on the southeast end of Canton in partnership with the city and with the Coleman Peel Community Center on the southeast end. So it's time to collect up those toys once again. Those donations can be dropped off here at 120 Cleveland Avenue Southwest or delivered directly to us via Amazon on our website at cantonforallpeople.org and on our Facebook page. We have the link that you can click and pick any of those items out for any of those kids. Anything that you're willing to give or offer would be a huge blessing and go a long way to making some child's Christmas a very special one indeed. This Sunday is also a Communion Sunday, so if you haven't already, go ahead and pause the video and go get your Communion elements for this Sunday. And now, friends, this Sunday, like every Sunday, feel free at any time during this service to write your prayer request into the comments section of this video so that we can be in prayer for you and then we can be in prayer for one another. So I invite you now, friends, at this time to prepare your hearts and minds for worship this morning.
Friends, our scripture reading this morning is going to come from the Gospel of Mark in chapter 12, picking up in verse 38. And it reads, As he, Jesus, taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in the long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogue and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put everything she had, all she had to live on. Friends, this is the Word of God for the people of God, and thanks be to God for it. Friends, this is the beginning of a short, a three-week series that we are calling The Unshakable Kingdom. And the reason we wanted to do this is getting into, and I know it's depressing to think about, Advents right around the corner where we celebrate the incarnation of Jesus Christ in our world today and the ushering of that kingdom. But I wanted to ask some really good questions and get into three general topics as we'll explain about this kingdom. What is it? Because the truth is Jesus went out preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. He used the phrase, the kingdom of God, a hundred times throughout the Gospels. And anything that he uses a hundred times is probably important for us to wake up and listen to. He was never misled by any other issue. He was laser focused on this thing that we call the kingdom of God. Everything that we see in our Gospels doesn't see Jesus get deviated to focusing on anything unworthwhile or even marginal. Jesus is coming to talk about this kingdom. And, what it, and I wondered, when we see this come up so much, what has happened? And what is maybe even your conception of the kingdom of God? And what's happened to our conception of the kingdom of God? So even when Jesus is crucified and he's resurrected, the 40 days with his disciples after his resurrection, he talked to them more about, you guessed it, the kingdom of God. And if we get this straight, he was saying that if we get this right, the kingdom of God, all of the rest will go straight. All of the ages will go straight with you. But if you get this wrong, all of the ages will then go wrong with you. Do we get it? Is it too big for perhaps even our small hearts to kind of grasp? And when Jesus was talking to his disciples and he comes back after he's resurrected and he, they, his disciples look at him and say, Lord, at this time, are you now going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And friends, we think that too, lest we think we're not different than the disciples here when we often put our own kingdoms, our own municipalities and governments at a level with what Jesus is talking about in the kingdom of God. When Christ hears this from us and the disciples in this time, his heart must have sunk back then. Here he was offering the very kingdom of God, a new world order, a new order, God's order, God's kingdom on earth. And they said, hey, do we get back our government? Right? Not the same thing. They didn't necessarily reject the kingdom of God. They just reduced it. And that's what we've been doing ever since. Oftentimes we don't reject the kingdom of God, but we often reduce it and make it into a much smaller thing and have too small of imaginations to realize the breadth and the depth of what Jesus Christ was trying to show us in this concept of the kingdom of God. E. Stanley Jones likes to bring up the fact that when the creeds were written in the third century, what had happened to this conception of the kingdom of God? The Nicene Creed, as he says, mentioned it, mentions it once. And then uh, beyond that, the borders in this life, what Jesus says in his prayer, thy kingdom come is an everlasting kingdom. The Apostles' Creed, the Athanasian Creed, don't mention it at all. 
And the three great historic creeds summing up all of the Christian doctrine mention once what Jesus mentioned 100 times. What's important for us to take from this is that we've often dropped out this kingdom from certain facets or sections of our lives that has crippled Christianity, particularly in the Western world. See, the kingdom of God was pressed into the inner recesses of the heart as an experience now and then pushed beyond the borders of this life and the future as a future kingdom as well. But there were areas that when we take on this kingdom that we leave out, that we say should, that the kingdom of God doesn't touch, or as I like to say, maybe those topics that we don't necessarily want to mesh our religion with. We leave sections as a result of our lives unredeemed in that way. The economic, the social, and often political things we don't want to discuss, and therefore a vacuum is left for other forces then to come in without Christians realizing the breadth of the dream that Jesus Christ had in coming to preach this coming kingdom, this unshakable kingdom. But that still asks the question, what is the kingdom? The kingdom is nothing less than God's total answer for humankind's total need. Let me say that one more time. The kingdom is nothing less than God's total answer for humankind's total need. In other words, it's God's plan, God's order, God's promise, and God's offer to all of us. And over the course of the next three weeks, we're going to examine three principles of this kingdom that we can apply to our lives today. That with everything that's facing us, we probably need to hear. Over the next three weeks, we'll look specifically at how this kingdom can give us guidance on these three things. So we're going to look at this unshakable kingdom and our money, the unshakable kingdom and the world's governments, more specifically how we as Christians relate to them as people with feet in both kingdoms, right? And lastly, how the unshakable kingdom relates to the concept of truth. Because I've talked to many people who have this universal kind of feeling among many folks uh, today that say that they're frustrated with the idea that now everything just seems to be relative. The things I thought were true, other people aren't saying, and, and some people are just claiming these basic facts just aren't true anymore. What is truth? Is there any truth to be claimed in the teachings of Jesus Christ about this kingdom that we can claim for our lives today and how we order our lives with God and with one another? Because there are some universal truths that we can hold on to that Jesus preached about this coming kingdom, which is why we're calling it the unshakable kingdom. So we'll hit money, government, and truth. Because if what we believe and what Jesus preached about the reality of the kingdom of God is true and unshakable, then what we know about money and government and people's opinions or thoughts about this thing or that is that those other things are anything but unshakable. Especially, I would say, when it comes to money. And we don't need to look any further than our own country here in the United States to make this point, right? In the United States, our country has generated and continues to generate more wealth than any other country ever has. And in most years, more wealth than all the other countries combined, put together. But when the financial system collapses like it did in 2008, or we see the effects of a pandemic play on our supply systems that we're seeing currently today, or when someone from OPEC just sneezes and, do and gas jumps up a dollar a gallon, it's safe to say that the systems and all the systems we create around our economies around the world and how they left are unfortunately very shakable. Our own personal financial systems are shakable. And much to the dismay of many folks like myself who wish that they were a little more sturdy, who are just trying to save money for maybe your kid's college or retirement or work to build some kind of emergency fund in case something were to happen, many of us are just one more accident on the playground away when we haven't reached our deductible yet. Or, or, or waiting for one more hike in our property taxes or, or, or values at home away from being very shaken within our finances. All over the world, money and economic systems are shakable with some really dire 
consequences. And this isn't going to be a sermon, although it would be a good one, about uh, what Jesus would think about many of those economic systems and how they advantage some and disadvantage others all over the world. Although that would be a good topic, that's not what we're going to talk about today because I think we can all agree that our systems around money and how we deal with them and how we've dealt with them throughout our whole life are very shakeable and sometimes fragile systems, no matter how hard we work to save money and do those things sometimes. Enter our gospel reading this morning. Jesus sits down across from the treasury of the church and apparently for others to be around him and listen to him talking as they watch this young, I will watch this widow come to the treasury and drop in what was the equivalent, as our scripture says, about a penny, which in those days and age, what she gave was about a day's working wage. And uh, the scripture shows us that that's all she had for the day. And Jesus makes that comment about how what she has given in her poverty is much more than what those people have lavished out as a result of their wealth. And I'm sure that when Jesus says this, enough for other folks to hear, the tax collector, you know, Matthew's probably coming around the corner and says, you know, well, actually, Jesus, it wasn't the same amount of money. The treasury needed this amount, and she only gave a penny. But that wasn't Jesus' point. Remember, Jesus is coming to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. And we get this kind of unique, intimate moment where he's sitting and watching the actions of this one widow come in and simply drop all that she has. And you've probably heard this message preached before on a stewardship time or trying to get you to give more money to the church or this cause or that. But this parable I think, when I read it, when put into the context of what Jesus was doing in the whole Gospel of Mark, he's making a kingdom kind of statement here. The parable is less about what people have to give and more about our willingness to give. Many people don't have the ability to give out of their generosity or even out of their poverty when it comes to their personal finances or their money. But I remember an interesting story about a guy at a local convenience store when an elderly man with his guide dog had come in. He went to the aisle with his greeting cards and he picked one up and he held it extremely close to his face because he struggled to read it. And just as the clerk was about to walk over to him, another gentleman from the store walked over and asked if he needed assistance reading the card. And then he proceeded to read him almost every single greeting card in the aisle until the elderly man smiled and said, That's perfect. My wife would love that one. See, I know that the issues of money, especially when we talk about wealth and poverty, are extremely complex. The anxiety about money is one that plagues both the rich and the poor, and it's a disease amongst both who have it and those who have not. Generous sharing of one's goods and what they have and free from the danger can free oneself from the danger that inflicts your soul of either being too greedy or wanting things that we don't have. The message here is for the disciples to handle material things so as to secure heaven and their future and not to be corrupted by money. How one handles one's money could have eternal consequences. See, the life of a disciple, of a Christian, is the one who's following these Christian principles about the kingdom of God is one that pays faithful attention to the frequent and familiar tasks each day, however small and insignificant that they may seem. The one faithful in today's nickels and dimes is the one who will be trusted with the big account. And Fred Craddock puts it this way, all of us have something to give, and when we think about all that the Lord is taking and doing for us, it's like taking a $1,000 bill and laying it on the table, and the Lord gives it to us. 
and he says, here's my life, Lord, I'm giving it all. See, but the reality for us is that most of us here is that with, we don't have bank accounts with those large amounts. It's almost like the kingdom of his God is like receiving that $1,000 bill and then cashing it in for quarters. We go through life putting out 25 cents here, 50 cents there. Listen to the neighbor's troubles instead of saying, you know, I really don't have the time today. Maybe even going to a committee meeting instead of doing what you wanted to do. Maybe he's giving a cup of water to a shaky old man in a nursing home instead of hanging out with your friends. Maybe it's coming down to the free store and making the commitment to live a life of greater generosity. See, usually giving in our lives isn't this big, glorious thing. It's not every day one wins the lottery and then presents, you know, some nonprofit that you really believe in, or maybe even your church with this great, grand, glorious gift, usually giving in our life isn't that glorious. It's just a small decision. But it's done in all of those little acts of love, 25 cents at a time. And it would be easy to go out in a flash of glory. It's harder, though, to live the Christian life little by little over the long haul. And we live in a, in a world where I know, and we're going to come up, I've already asked you for Christmas toys, where we're inclined to be generous with other people sporadically, as we're reminded to do it. You often hear of organizations and people uh, downtown, and, and, and in Canton, there's, there's, there's no shortage of people who come in and around the holidays, churches, namely, as we say, kind of parachute in to do their large, big event, and we don't see them the other 360 days of the year. See, I don't think the kingdom works like that. And that if we're to reflect kingdom principles with our money and our time and our resources, Christian generosity over time reflects those of giving the nickels and the dimes over the course of our life, giving consistent, regularly, and predictably. A friend of mine wrote, the true reason for Christian giving is gratitude to God. And luckily for us, God does not give to us sporadically or unpredictably. Friends, the thing is, I don't think this widow from our gospel text could do otherwise. It's just who she was. She was going to give. She lived a kingdom kind of life, and Jesus, in this intimate moment, takes notice to make a teaching lesson for all to see and for us to see today. I don't think she could do otherwise. Friends, I told you it's not a sermon about it, but as we know, all of us have to pay taxes. All economic systems all across the world have to enforce generosity from people by law. But it's a forced generosity. Some people, uh, you know, get really upset around tax time about having to pay their taxes, etc. And you feel begrudging on having to give that up one time uh, a year to do your taxes and pay all those things. But here's my point. When we follow kingdom principles, Jesus isn't standing there making you do everything. It was a way of life for this woman. And Jesus, sitting opposite the treasury, is trying to point that out to everyone else. Her giving, not just monetary giving, but her giving of herself. When we look at the text and what she gave and the, and the way that it was reflected in the Hebrew, it or in the Greek, it specifically references her whole life that she put into that treasury. Because we know it's the same thing that Christ is then going to go offer for her and all of us. I don't think she could do otherwise. There was freedom in that. You weren't going to stop her from putting her two pennies in there, despite all else. Friends, a shakable kingdom, 
and one that holds on to your resources both financially and with your time was one with clenched fist is one or one that may only provide periodically and unpredictably is a shakable kingdom Because it's easy to get to that point and go, oh, you know, it's Christmas time, but I got all this other stuff going on, and you know what? Maybe this year I'll just cut that out. I'm not going to be able to go and make that trip down to the United Way or to the Akron Canton Food Bank or to Crossroads or to Tikva or to wherever it is that you like to serve and put your hands into doing great things with other people. That's a shakable system, a shakable kingdom. An unshakable one is one that is rooted in Jesus Christ that says that generosity is a way of life in this kingdom and that generosity is going to be my way of life. There's nothing you can do that's going to stop me from giving of myself and what I have. An unshakable kingdom is one that simply cannot do otherwise. It is all that we know. An unshakable kingdom knows nothing but gratitude and nothing but generosity. Recently, just last week, our oldest member, Miss Jane Best, passed away. She was 101 years old. Beautiful woman. Who I had the joy of celebrating her 100th birthday with right before the pandemic started. And in talking to the family and preparing for her memorial service coming up, I was moved by a small story. The small story that said, you know, Miss Best, over the whole course of her life, and we all know, go from uh, being uh, these young folks who can do everything. Then as you grow older, and especially you get to be 100, and you get up to uh, Miss Best Days, 101, there are things, and you're, you're limited both physically and sometimes mentally. But over the course of her whole life, she always wrote cards to people faithfully and was always very selective in the cards that she picked out to send people because she wanted them to feel very special to her and special, uh, uh, a special person in this world. And Miss Best even in those final weeks that she was spending here with us, her daughter told me that there wasn't anything that we could do. She was still going to find her way over to her card drawer to continue to write cards of hope and of love to her neighbors, her friends, her family, to make them feel special and let them know that they mattered to her. There was nothing that you were going to do. She had the kingdom within her heart. There was no age, there was no uh, mental incapability in, in that was going to stop her from doing the kingdom work that she knew she was called to do. Friends, it's with that spirit of generosity that I, we invite you into with your money, with your time, with your treasure, with your talent, putting them to good work Make a plan this coming year, heading into this Christmas season, and let it spur you all the way into 2022 to live the kingdom principle so that there is nothing that's going to stop you from giving of your time, your talent, your treasure, and your resources. Because the one that so selflessly gave to us that night that he was handed over to be crucified, he sat with his disciples around the table, picked up the loaf of bread, lifted it to heaven, and gave thanks. And out of the gratitude of giving thanks and the gratitude for what God has given him, said, this is my body which is broken for you. God, we give you thanks for this bread and we give you thanks for this life and as a result of what you've done, I'm giving my life for you. Renzi took that bread, broke it, simply said, take and eat. Every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, likewise, on that same night, Jesus took the cup, lifted it to heaven, and guess what? Gave thanks. And as a result of what God had done in giving him life and stewarding this world and all that he's given him, said, you know what, this is my blood. 
given and shed for you. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. Friends, at this time I invite you to pray with me. Lord, sometimes we feel like we have nothing to give. Sometimes we feel like this world just takes from us. It drains us dry. We sometimes feel like we just don't have enough to go on, not enough money, not enough energy, and not enough hope. But as people of your kingdom, we know better. We might not have cars, the fame, and the glory this world brings. We might not have titles and positions. We might not have a home even to call our own. We might not have a lot of free time, but we have you and you give. Lord, you give us so much. You give us shelter and daily bread. You give us families and friends. You give us hope, love, and faith. You give us yourself. You're even bold enough to meet us where we are. It might be in prison. It might be in the boardroom. It might be in the ditch. It might be in the courtroom. It might be in the judge's chamber. It might be on the streets. It might be in our homes. And it might be in a homeless shelter. And it might even be here in a cathedral or on an online worship service, a storefront. Either way, you meet us where we are. And you give. So what we have, Lord, we give to you. Like the widow who gave all she had. We know we can't beat your giving. We have enough. And we give it to you, Jesus, in your name. And pray the prayer your Son taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, may you go from this place not as one with a shakable spirit of giving, but an unshakable spirit of generosity and giving back your time, your talent, your treasure, your resources, because we can give thanks for what God has done for us. Friends, may you go in peace, live in peace, and have a wonderful week. And we'll see you again next week.